Okay, so we're going to begin. Can you see me? There we are. Hello. Okay, so week two. Thank you so much for joining us um, on Expand Your Legacy, Write Your Book. We are recording this. Um, we've got Pat Patterson who's joined us for the next couple weeks. We're really glad to have you here and hear about your project, Pat. Um, we've got Richard on the line. We're waiting for Robert to join in. And we've got Stacy here in our chat box. And um, Richard, oh, you were talking right before you got on. You were giving us an update about what you got, were able to get uh, accomplished in the last week. Do you want to tell us about it, how much writing you got done? Yeah, I did 110 minutes, a little over that. I, I didn't... Um break it down to the exact moment, but 110, 115 minutes. That's great, great. Uh, so Pat, yeah, a timer helps a lot. A timer helps a lot. So what everybody... So I just, no, please go ahead, Richard. No, that was it. I just set a timer there, started, and you know, once so you're back, that 10 minutes. what everybody committed to last week was uh, 10 to 15 minutes of timed writing, uh, no multitasking, no interference. And um, that was a really big, um, a big commitment that everybody did. We're, we're going to continue throughout it, uh, throughout the next five-week session, because we will accumulate six written hours of material and content. And Pat, when you watch last week's um, slide presentation, you'll you'll catch up on that. Um, right here, I've got Stacy's uh, writing for what she did. Stacy uh, spent 30 minutes to write her introduction, in which I'm going to read to you all. Um, so uh, Stacy is a former high school athlete, is what she says. I, she shepherds uh, her three daughters through their own experiences. And she still remembers having on the back of her jersey uh, A-Rod Jr. Uh, when she used to play. Uh, after the Seattle Mariner baseball player, I thought A-Rod was a New York Yankee, so forgive me. Um, that's what I know about sports. By, her best memories growing up included baseball games with her dad and going to watch brothers baseball games. Uh, she would even record the M uh, MLB All-Star games um, when she was out at practice so that her and dad, her father could connect on it. And then even when she still to this day talks to her father, um, grandfather, or kids on the phone, they still discuss baseball. Um, so there's, anyway, she says um, what we, what, one of the things we did, did last week is to um, talk about our why, why we're writing the book, because it's not just uh, it's not just about the book. We're, we're approaching this whole project both from a higher perspective of a project and we're also uh, approaching it from the actual writing. So this is Stacy's why. Um, she talks about here having met her best friends through uh, softball, still continues to stay in touch with it, with friends through Facebook. When I think of high school, I only think of softball. We traveled everywhere together. We went and lost. Um, there were weekends growing up that I never saw anyone outside of soft softball. I don't regret this for a minute. Uh, when I was going to college, I never tried out for a softball team, and, although I believe I could have made it. I just got a, a job and was serious about my studies, and I didn't have any large scholarships um, and knew that I would have uh, student loans to pile up after graduation, which is why she chose um, the uh, softball over, of uh, working over the softball. Um, but she's found softball as an adult in her life, and she continues to coach for her daughters. Um, she says the heartache, the fear, the pain, and the love of the game. She's witnessed some of the highs and lows through her high school daughters. One is 17 and she isn't sure she wants to continue playing. She just loves having fun and being out there with her friends, and her 15-year-old is a lot fiercer. Um, and then they watch college softball together. So she talks about that. Her youngest is involved in cheerleading. And her husband also supports her. Cheerleading is very emotional. Oh, is, cheerleading is very emotional. Um, never had to deal with so much makeup and hairspray in the softball territory, but the youngest one loves it. Um, that is where a parent comes in for the daughter. We have to be there for them emotionally. They aren't boys. They respond differently to sports. There's a, they're used to a lot more crying. Sometimes it seems they get hurt easier than boys or they are embarrassed. But girls are so fun to watch and cheer with as they share their emotions on their sleeve. We wanted them to succeed and follow their dreams. We also have to be there to catch them if they want to be a, a MLB coach and learn that they can. It's a hard course for women, but we can show them the path um, that they can both enjoy and compete. 
Um, the other chapters in her book she's looking at is, you know, choosing a sport, coaching, and parent. Like, how as a parent do you help your child uh, choose a sport? Uh, boys versus girls sports. Um, another chapter would be safety versus fear. Also, when uh, what happens when your girl gets hurt, uh, and the emotional roller coaster of raising daughters in sports. And you are a parent first, and then coaching and being a fan second. And then what all what to do after graduation is. Um, the layout for her book right now. So, Stacy, thank you so much for that. Um, I think that's really great. Does uh, anybody have any thoughts or feedback on that um, with Stacy here? I think it was a really great why. And then, Stacy, I believe that you're going also here for the idea that your um, your reader is parents of teenage girls, tween to teenage girls, you know, getting involved in sports. So, um, so thank you very much for that. And then, Pat, do you want to introduce yourself and just tell us about your book project before we get started in our content for today? Sure. Yeah, I'm Pat Patterson, the next client of the Yakis, and <clears throat> my book is uh, working title's Creative U-Turn, Y-O-U-U, -U, uh, and it's geared to probably a boomer, 50 plus, uh, that is making a transition into something more creative. So it is highlighting uh, what might be feasible for somebody in terms of uh, reigniting some long lost talents that they might have, some passion they had as a, a young person, or whatever, you know, mu music, art, writing, uh, and then a step-by-step -step approach as to how to transition from kind of a day job into what I call a montage career, which is having multiple revenue streams to sustain you so you can do things uh, that you want to do. And it's, and it's pretty finished. I mean, it's, I shouldn't say it's pretty finished, but it's, you know, probably 70% written. Uh, so what I'm after in this in these sessions is just prioritizing it, getting it organized, and getting it out there. That's really great, Pat. Um, Robert, who we're expecting to join on the call, but if you watch the uh, recording, he actually has a book that's out and is in the process of doing a um, basically a rewrite or an update. And so he, so we have um, just. Uh, just contextualizing for you that everybody's kind of at various stages here of in the in the whole process. That was good to hear. Yeah. So, um, so the structure of today's call, we just you know did a round of introductions, kind of went over what we did uh, between last week's call and this week's call. And then to go through today is a little bit more nitty gritty. I think today's kind of a little bit of a tighter day. Uh, Pat, we sent you um, a pre-call recording, and we sent you last week's actual recording. Uh, Richard, yep. we'll forward you the PowerPoint for today as well, and so we'll do that. Stacey, I know you're actually watching the PowerPoint. So we got that going, but today's a little bit more nitty-gritty in terms of I uh, want to talk to you, uh, address the fact that if you want a publisher, what the, are the ingredients that you need for a book proposal to sell a book proposal? Because last week we outlined just loosely the advantages and disadvantages of publishing versus self-publishing. And um, TV Guestbook Publishing is a hybrid publisher, even though um, we're definitely not a self-published publisher. So we're going to talk about book proposal. Um, so here are the proposal contents for, that um, are required for a book proposal. Uh, one is the introduction. Uh, two is the author background. Three is the audience for the book, which is what we just did last week. Uh, four is the promotional ideas. Five is the analysis of the competition. Six is endorsements, seven is future book titles, um, book table of contents, chapter summaries, forward, and sample chapters. So essentially, uh, even if you're not going to go for a formal publisher, you're going to the, all of these ingredients are going to be required in putting together the book anyway. So this is just a really great exercise to go through. And we already started on some of this last week, from last week to this week, especially the audience for the book. This is the who, the, who is your reader um, specifically that we're talking about. And ironically, I'm just going to say it's 415, but at 630 tonight, 630 tonight, we have our book signing at Mystic Journey in Venice at Abbott Kinney for uh, Dr. Guyane De Silva. I'm just going to 
show you her book right here, um, the Psychiatrist Guide Helping Parents Reach Their Depressed Tween. And, um, and I bring that up because the audience for that book is, you know, very specific. It's for really for parents, parenting book, parenting for tweens um, and young, you know, teenagers is what that book is for. So these proposal proposal contents we're going to be we're going to be getting to um, throughout the the work that we do. Uh, every book uh, should have an introduction, uh, whether it actually is beco becomes part of the formal piece of the introduction. Uh, we kind of covered this last week with our with, within our homework process. We did the why. Uh, this is the introduction that I did for uh, Get on TV, which was we, the television producers, we want you. We're looking for you. We're looking for new ideas, new faces all the time. Ultimately, that is what we make a living doing. We package and sell to a mass viewer, and what we package are people, ideas, and concepts. It's about connection. This book is going to tell you how to connect with us and how to get into our Rolodex. So ultimately, you can connect with the masses. Isn't that what you want in the first place for your message to be heard and be seen? So that's our with the introduction that I had um, did within my book proposal for uh, Get on TV. Um, author's background is also significantly important, obviously, it's your bio. It's, um, we do, uh, just so you know in our structure of our books, we do two, page, uh, two different bio sections. We do one here on the back cover, uh, which is uh, kind of a, it's the shorter bio. And then we do an entire bio page in the back of the book, which is the long form bio. With, we also give the very specific um, contact information for the author because part of the strategy of doing the business card of doing the book is to collect the database of people. So we don't have a problem. We just set up an um, email and uh, for the people to write her directly so that we can build out that database. This is what we're, these are all of the business strategy structures that we're incorporating within the context of why we do a book aside from just writing a book. This is one of the reasons. So we do a, a short short bio, which goes on the back cover, and we do a long-form bio, which includes more of the things like the education and the schools and residencies and da 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 da, -da um, than you would on the back cover. So we do two bios within our books. Um, so just uh, should keep that in mind. That's part of the author's background there. And I don't think, you, you know, these are things that people don't tell you about, so, but I think these uh, details are really important. Uh, the audience for the book goes into the book proposal. Um, this is the, where we started with what, the reader, uh, which we did last week is identifying the reader. I don't know if anybody, uh, part of our homework last week was also to go to the bookstore bookshelf and to see where on the bookshelf bookstore um, your book would fit into. Uh, Pat, when you listen to the recording from last week, I kind of go into metadata tagging and how books are tagged and how that real estate bookstore bookshelf space is fought for. So really getting clear on the reader. But this part here of who the reader is, is the audience for the book, um, is what goes inside the book proposal. So if you wrote your why, then you would just elaborate on it a little bit more to put this in your book proposal, which is the audience for the book or the reader for the book. Um, obviously, I wrote that in television language. It should really be the reader for this book instead of the audience. But Anyone uh, holding this book in its hands right now who even has the germ of an idea, this book is for you. This book is targeted specifically towards general public. The truth is, anyone can cultivate a relationship with a television pro producer, given that they have the proper knowledge and understanding of the inner workings of the industry. Jackie proposes to reveal these inner workings animal lovers, trainers, and their pets. This book will tell the reader whether pets are truly as exceptional as we think, and if they, are, if they are, how he can go about making them famous. Corporations, corporations trying to get a product out, corporations trying to get an idea or a policy out, companies trying to raise its profile, or to correct an image blunder, will learn how to navigate based on its desired results. So funny, we were, um, you know, because here at TV Best, but we're, we're always dealing with content in the moment. And so Elizabeth Banks, you know, just spoke out on a, a, a speaking on a forum and basically kind of criticized Steven Spielberg for not doing very enough female oriented um, films. And she, the backlash on that is really huge because one, you know, Steven Spielberg hasn't done anything, you know, disingenuous towards women and he has done 
female-led um, films, which she was misinformed in that, and people called her out quickly because obviously The Color Purple was one of his big films. But anyway, you know, this is where this book, where I would, you know, throw in a, you know, a line here about, you know, an image blunder. Um, so we'll learn how to navigate based on desired results on entrepreneurs. Um, I, wrote, I think I wrote this audience for the book several, I guess well, probably a decade ago, and I will note that it's probably too broad um, an audience. I think I'm trying to hit too many people. So from a publisher's perspective, I would say to tighten the audience. So my philosophy is your book reader needs to be really who the audience is, needs to be very tight, but who your marketing audience can, is can be very broad. So we'll get into that as well. Um, the next slide here is... Promotional ideas. Um, so in the book proposal, we put in what promotional ideas are, how to promote a book. I kind of use promoting versus marketing. In, in uh, there's kind of synonymous, but I, I kind of stick with them in a, in a very in a different way. Um, yeah. So promotional to me is more like live events, marketing events, the book signing we're doing tonight. Whereas marketing is more like how we're handling the sales of a book. Uh, for this parenting book, A Psychiatrist Guide Helping Parents Reach the Depressed Tweens, we're really going after parenting magazines, parenting books, parenting bloggers, mommy bloggers, everything all junior high um, is how we're doing it, and very, very neighborhood council type approaches to it. And that is more of my marketing language, whereas my promotional language is really how we're going to elevate it on TV. We've got a couple book signings um, in Portland, Oregon at the New Renaissance, and we were able to book four different segments. Um, for promoting that book signing. So we've got a lot of cost promotion going on there. So I kind of use those words interchangeably. Moving on to endorsements, uh, letting, me, uh, letting me bring this up. Um, Robert hasn't joined the call yet, but um, he's got a really good uh, Rolodex of people. And I know that Lou Ferrigno is one of his people. Um, so it's something that he can do for an endorsement. Endorsements are remarkably important. Uh, one, they provide the book blurbs. So they go into the book blurbs, the endorsements go into the book proposal. They are also used on the back jacket book cover. They also get placed on the Amazon web page. So it's very important uh, in the construct of a book to go after endorsements while you're writing the book, not when the book is finished. And the way that we approach the endorsements of the company is we actually write them for the person that we're pre uh, presenting or pitching to. And um, we've collected a lot of, we, uh, for my books and the books we work with, we'll end up collecting a lot more endorsements than we use. We only end up using a few on the actual book cover, but then we'll put them into all of the marketing material depending on the value and the quality. But this is a great place to use the sphere of influence. It also oddly holds you accountable to uh, completing your book because when you've asked someone to endorse your book and you have your book intro and you have your author's background and you have some of the ingredients, you don't need the whole book to go after an endorsement. A lot of people wait until the book is done. And I say, you know, Part of the business part of creating the product of the book is getting these endorsements way ahead of time. Um, and it'll keep you also accountable for finishing it, uh, which I think is really important. Because they know that they've already contributed to, to it. So pull on your, um, your sphere of influence for your, your book and, uh, endorsements right away. Also another ingredient that goes into the book proposal is the competition. Uh, so you have to go on to Amazon and look at the competition for the book. And um, this doesn't provide the ISBN numbers, but the, you do need to provide in your book proposal uh, this date and age the ISBN numbers of the other books that you are in your competition to. I remember being like, oh, I don't want to put anybody else's book in. There's really no competition. Nobody else has a book like mine. Blah, blah, blah. But, you know, everybody else is going to do the same research. So, um pull out your, you know, your competition and then, you know, what your book proposal is going to be about is making a really good argument as to why um, your book is going to sell better. The whole book proposal is all about selling the book anyway. And then future book titles. Um, this is really lame, but my first book, Get on TV, we called it Booked in a Flash before it became published. And um, having become a publisher, what I can tell you is that we have a lot of placeholders for names. We don't actually come up with the title of the book until we're probably 80% done with the book. 
And then, because we're so far into it, the title ultimately reveals itself to us. So we just do placeholder titles. Um, we hold off until we are ready to lock a book cover or you know, lock marketing tier, material before we actually commit to it. But we, we, just, we just hold placeholders. But this was a really book, bad placeholder for my book, Get on TV, which is called Booked in a Flash, How to Get on TV, or Booked in a Flash, How to Become a TV Talk Show Host. <laughs> Booked in a Flash. Just makes me think of Flash Board and How to Get Your Show on TV. Anyway, that was the whole concept. Um, so I'm glad that somebody smarter than me came up with a better title than that. Uh, but in your book proposal, you know, to come up with a list of what future titles will work is really important. Then um, your table of contents is, which is essentially the outline that we're going to put together um, in our course of the, you know, the next couple of weeks, we're going to do an outline, but your outline actually becomes your table of contents. And then your outline is a working table of contents. Um, as I said last week, when we did this book, when it was first written last, when we first finished it last, I think October, the outline uh, was we, what we did with it when we went to the editing phase is we moved chapters 8 to 11 became chapters 1 through 5. And then everything got pushed up. So the outline was revised to reflect that uh, change in the stacking. And then, you know, that's where we drew the table of contents for. And so the reason I'm showing this is that, you know, everybody, people get very overwhelmed with, you know, the whole idea of getting a book done. But really, a book is uh, like putting together a house. You put together a kitchen. You put together the bathroom. You put together a master bedroom. There's just a certain amount of ingredients that are very formulaic that we do here. So the table of contents is your outline. And, it, and when you're a go-to galley with your book, this is the last page that gets, uh, it's actually the last, very last page that gets corrected on it. So your working outline is always there, um, always working through it. This is also an important exercise for all of us, even if we're not doing a formal book proposal or, and not seeking a formal literary agent, is the chapter summaries. So after you do, you break down your outline, you just write two or three paragraphs on each chapter, what those chapters are going to be about. And it just gives you clarity. Uh, and of course, everything changes as you're into the writing process, but at least you have a roadmap. And as all of us know that it's no fun driving anywhere that you've never been before if you don't have a, at least a map to go off of, uh, even if you take the scenic route. So the forward here that I did is uh, I got Donnie Osmond. Um, wrote the forward for my book here. So we just talked about getting our endorsements from our highest profile uh, sphere of influence. And I was you know, an Emmy nominated producer from their show, their talk show, The Donnie Marie Show. So I asked Donnie Osmond to write the forward for the book. And here is the trick to getting someone to do your forwards and your endorsements. Just like your endorsements, you, when you're doing your forward, you, pr you write the forward for them. So because nobody ever is going to want to do the work. Uh, so we, we write the forward, and then we present the forward, and we present it to the people that we want to contribute to the forward. And we basically say, this is the suggestion of what it might look like if you were to provide or write a forward for me. And of course, make any changes that you feel free to, you know, to change or that's more organic to you that you would like to have uh, uh, accordingly. And that is how we get those, um, you know, that's how we get our forwards. We, we, we write them and we rewrite them for them. And uh, because I used to write his television show scripts, it was actually very easy to write in his language. But, um, you know, anybody that you know really well should um, liken to it. I think that's the easiest way to get a uh, forward done for your book. Uh, sample chapters also goes into the book proposal. Um, going back to the celebrity endorsements and the forward, why that's important is if you're going after a literary agent and a publisher, they, they want to know the celebrity cachet that's going to be attached to the project. Uh, so that's why those things are, ingredients are important to bring up, really get them in alignment uh, early on. And then of course you do a full sample chapter uh, of the book and um, I think Sometimes it requires two or three uh, chapters to um, it, it within a book proposal. Moving on to book covers. Um, so I've got three versions of the Get On TV book co cover here. And um, because at TV Guestbert, I advocate 
uh, branding of experts, experts who run businesses or experts who have a message. I'm a big advocate of having the uh, author of the book space on the cover of the book. That's I, I'm a big advocate of it. I feel like it's, if this is going to be your business card and this is what people are going to recognize you for and this is what you're claiming as your expertise, then to have the, the recognition of the book cover, uh, a face on the book cover is really important. Um, and we have done that in a, like, in this particular case, I've got um, Guyani's book here. We put her, we just put a small picture of her on the, on the front cover. But on other books that we've done, we've done full, full spread layout pictures. I think we've only had one author of ours refuse to put his uh, picture on the book. I'm showing you the three covers here because these were the evolutions of the covers of the book, Get on TV. And though we, it came at a time when flat screen televisions weren't out quite yet, so we had to evolve the book cover for that. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm big on the branding. This book was published by Sourcebooks, and they were also very in on the branding, too. So here is how we've done other uh, book covers. We did Christy Whitman. We did her on the art of having it at all. And I, ironically, we found um, Susan Lucci had done a book about having it all, and she's kind of sitting in the same position. Um, ideas pop up in the zeitgeist even when they're not copied. Um, and this is Jennifer McLean um, for spontaneous transformation. And again, I, you know, just you know, I, this, to me, it's about name and uh, recognition. We're branding experts, and we're branding experts in their books and their expertise. So to me, I find that really valuable. You will get a difference of opinion on it, but I don't think that everybody is approaching the whole book product and project uh, in the same way that we are doing here at TV Guestmart. Uh, so my second book, Heartfelt Marketing, um, also went through an evolution of book covers here. Um, the first one, the first book title we called it was Spiritual Marketing, making the universe work for you and your business so that you can be of service to others. And then I'm standing in traffic in the Namaste position. And we took it to Book Expo in New York City, the you know annual book conference, and we presented it to our um, sales book team. And they, our sales book team is really fantastic, and they have been around for a very long time. And you know they live in different parts of the country that is outside of Los Angeles and outside of New York, and they thought that the book was. Um, Stephanie was with me at this meeting. Uh, they thought the book was marketing to religious congregations so that they can increase their attendance at churches. That's not what the book was about at all. And it was a really valuable lesson for me, um, both as an advocate of other people's books, to make sure that, one, um, I'm getting input on book titles, book images, book content from my sales team and people in other parts of the country with other diverse uh, experiences and perceptions and that we're not doing it in our own little isolated fishbowl here in Los Angeles. So when we, especially when we're ghostwriting a book, we go through uh, the um, process of getting feedback along the way so that we know, we know what other people are going to take away from the book as we go through it. So the fact that I was also in the namaste position, which is really, you know, in, Los Angeles, it's a yoga position, and in Oklahoma, it's a prayer position. So that was also very misleading and quite a surprise to me. So we went back, um, and Richard actually contributed to the book title here, um, Heartfelt Marketing became the title that was suggested by the sales reps. They liked Heartfelt Marketing, and I was like, oh, that's kind of really not what I'm going for, but they were right. And then the subtitle was Allowing the Universe to Be Your Business Partner. And Richard had given us that one. And we put my hand on my heart instead of in the prayer position. And that was, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm just letting you know that this is, you know, whole thing is a process, it's an evolution. Um, you know, books shouldn't be written in isolation, which is why I really appreciate that there is a handful of us uh, supporting each other in the development of our work and the author's part of the work so that, you know, we get feedback that's going to be necessary because a lot of people have a lot of different perceptions about what we're trying to communicate, especially when we're doing a volume of material, which is what we're putting out here as well. 
uh, one sheet. One sheet is the tool that we use as publishers to market the book within the publishing industry. So when we're working with within the publishing industry, when you go through your book proposal, this is what your literary agent does in the fall to the publisher. We do this as publishers, all publishers do this. If you self-publish, you should do this for yourself anyway. So this is, I guess, an insider's you know, secret that all publishers are really required to have this on all their titles and all their books. But we do it as a one sheet and it's essentially broken down. It looks like this. Uh, here's a handful of our one sheets. But it's got the book cover, it's got our company logo, it's got the ISBN number, which I call the social security number that goes with the book. Um, those can be those can be obviously purchased, but when you purchase them, it becomes an ID number that's associated with the publisher. So a lot of people will come to us in TV Guestbrook Publishing and say, I have a self-published book, I've got 400 books on Amazon, can you just take this over and publish it? What they don't realize is that we need to dismantle what they already have up on their self-published book on Amazon. It has to be dismantled, and then we have to essentially rebrand it, not in a marketing branding way, but in an um, ID branding way throughout the publishing industry in order to recognize that it is a title that is under our social security number or ISBN number and not theirs. So even though it looks very easy and surface, we just, we just had a girl who said, I think she said she sold 7,000 books self-published, but Barnes & Noble will not pick her up unless she's formally published. So she's coming to us saying, I sold these you know, 7,000, 8,000 books. Can you just publish me and get me into Barnes & Noble? And she doesn't realize that it's a mechanism process um, that's much bigger than, um, than she realizes because a published book is setting up an infrastructure of releasing a product into a national marketplace. A self-published book is just putting a web page up and having a fulfillment house just put out the books. It's a very different structure. So the ISBN numbers are like the social security number. Everybody has to have one for their book. You purchase them, but they're uh, associated with the actual purchaser of the book. Um, so when we're selling somebody's books, those numbers have to be reflective that they're of ours. Um, we put in a marketing strategy. We also put the BISAC codes in, which we talked about last week, and the importance of the tagging of the BISAC codes. Um, we also list how it's, the book is being distributed. Again, this is within the publishing community because I have to get this out to all the distributors that buy at a wholesale level the books that are going out into the marketplace, and that's what we do. Then we put in a summary of what the book is about, which uh, we've stayed uh, at pace with this, our five-week course here. You will have a summary of the book, and your summary of the book will go in your book proposal, and it will also go on the back cover, and it would also go on your one sheet. And you can see, again, how these mechanisms all break down. And then we put your fabulous headshot, and you know I am all obsessed about really good headshots. Um, headshots to me are to do or to die. And then we put that uh, bio that I, we spoke about. Uh, most of the bios that we do are the short form bios that would be on the back cover of the book. So that's how we're repurposing the content there. But that's what the one sheet is. Even if you're self-publishing, I would suggest you would assemble a one sheet, um, even fairly least for when you're going to be trying to, you know, setting up bookstore, uh, book signings, you will want to submit your one sheet with it. So your homework, where well, we're not using that word, but your creative inspiration, how I'm inspiring you for next week, is to make a list of your dream forwards and your dream endorsements. So who are the people that you would, even if you don't know them, who would be the people that would um, you would wish would be your wish list for your forwards and your endorsements? And the reason that I bring that up is that I think sometimes when we recognize what we you know hope for. Um, we, it's amazing how we end up running into them. If we hadn't thought of it ahead of time, we might not have known how to approach them when that is supposed to happen. So we do the uh, endorsements and the forwards um, for the uh, for your book. Just make the wish list. Um, in our last round um, of our last group that we did, it was really amazing to see how some of those endorsements just started to. Um, come into place in the course of the, the weeks that we were together. And then also, um, we're going to, if you did the uh, assignment from last week, which was the go to the bookstore bookshelf and look at where your book would be placed, and if you observe some of the books that were amongst the bookstore bookshelf, then you would, um, you could start putting, you know, doing the research on them as competition because they're 
creative inspiration for next week will be to write a summary of your book competition. And then, of course, it's easy to do it on Amazon. Um, so this is good for you whether you're writing it in a book proposal or you're not. And then the next um, creative inspiration for next week will be to take screenshots of the likeness of the book covers that you desire. So, um, so you just the images, the colors, the sensibility of it. Um, is it a Michael Crichton type book cover or is it more of a personality book cover? Uh, I think it's a really good idea just to kind of take a screenshot just to see the likeness, the color palette. Uh, we often do that when, you know, if you do headshots through us, we'll, we'll put together a vision or a montage of kind of what we're looking for in terms of the branding for, with, along with the photographer so that, and it has nothing to do with the actual person that we're really shooting, but we do it so we storyboard what we're trying to get out of the image that we're looking to create and we're looking to do that here. Um, it does not look like Robert joined the call, but he had sent in his book, Safe Stardom, How to Protect Your Children on the Road to Fame. Um, I actually like how he has Hollywood Entertainment lawyer Robert Bundy at the bottom. Um, and I also like that, you know, he's got Dora the Explorer, the voice of Dora the Explorer on it. Um, and so some, one, of, one of the things he had requested in um, our conversation between this week and next week, or last week, was what we thought of his book cover. So I don't know, Pat, if you received it or if you can see it. Richard, we sent it to you. Stacy, we sent it to you. Um, we, we can wait till next week to give Robert feedback, but we're going to send him this recording anyway if anybody has any initial hits that they want to share about. He's wondering if you should redefine the cover. I like it. You like it. There yeah, you go. I do. And, and, well, I, and <clears throat> I just think, I think it's a great title. Um, I get that it's kids and entertainment. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I think it's very good, actually. I think it's very self-explanatory. I know what I know with mine, I haven't gone through the titles, and I haven't done, really done any mock-ups of the covers. You know, it's just the idea of it being a quick read, you know, this is and not getting too clever uh, is, is what I'm getting feedback, you know, uh, that you, just, you kind of say what the book's about rather than being too clever. I, I agree. I agree. Stacey here says well, she loves the title on the cover as well. I actually like the title too about safe, safe stardom. Um, I like that. I, I think How to Protect Your Children on the Road to Fame. I think it's a great title and a great subtitle. Um, I, I'm not looking at the back of it, but it, you know, obviously I would definitely put uh, Robert's picture on the back. If not on the front, if there's maybe a high profile young um, starlet or star that he, I'm just saying, like if Robert represented Leonardo DiCaprio in his youth, that would be um, something that I'd probably also put in a box in the front corner. That would be me. Um, but that's it. Any, Richard, did you have a chance to look at it? Did I just put you on a spot or No, uh, not yet. Uh, okay, no, I'm no worries. driving. Okay, no worries. No worries. Well, you'll see it and it, um, uh, uh, the only one thing that I might say, that just cause, and just because this is occurring to me, is, you know, this is promoting, this, you know, this this is a very wholesome, safe cover, which is one aspect. The other idea would be to show, you know, representations of some of the calamities. You know, uh, you know, here's because I think there is a piece of this. Is you know, you don't want your child to end up like, I can't think of anybody. Yeah, like uh, uh, Todd, Bur no, Todd Bridges, he's still alive. Um, Gary Coleman's still alive, but most of them are, most of them are dead, aren't they? Um, yeah, but, you know, yeah, I know that's I, I, spatializing, but if you, you know, you could show that juxtaposition, it might. Yeah, even if it's like a, a mock headlines of child stars. Um, yeah. yeah. That is a, that's a, that is definitely a, a good and a different approach. Um, I know that Robert will have for us. Uh, he's got a story behind where he came up with the with the title of the book, um, which is, which I think is will be curious to hear. Safe start and how to protect your children on their road to fame. 
The other thing I think that um, Robert needs to um, really see this book as is a parent, it is a parenting book. It's a parenting business book, but it's still a parenting book. Um, or at least it, from a marketing perspective, um, to be approached as a parenting book. Because um, that's really who he's going after, our, our parents. Um, so, yeah, so that's, uh, yeah, that's, yeah, this, uh, real quickly, I hope it's our last screenshot, is just a culmination of all of our different book titles. So, the book covers, you can kind of see how we, uh, we, we played with different images and different titles. Um, Darren Campo's book series has a specific theme. We actually used a, uh, uh, a guy who does movie posters, recycling movies. It's who did most of his book covers, mm -hmm. except Stingers. So, we, yeah, we, we try to be very specific, yeah. Uh, for Alex Details Revolution and Alex Details Rebellion, we used somebody who does sci-fi fiction movie posters is how we did that cover. But I, I, when I have the opportunity, I really like to put the author on, um, author's picture on the cover. Um, so, any questions at all um, regarding this? It, to, to me, this is a little bit nitty-gritty because we really went over a book proposal and the content of it. Um, but we're, we're, what we're trying to do is assemble all of the, the individual pieces that are go into forming all, all the elements that you're going to need or all the ingredients that you're going to need for, for your book. And if you have already done these pieces, then um, you might just, you know, revisit them as a refresher. Or if you, um, uh, next week I think we get more into marketing and promotion, which is more exciting for me. But if we, like I said last week, if we don't have a book written, if we don't have it, we don't have writing, we don't have a book. And um, if we don't have a package, we don't have a book. So, and the other thing I was really kind of thinking this week too is that, I was like, do you really even have a book if you don't have a reader? I was really playing with that idea. Like, it's kind of that whole tree, which is like, does a tree make a noise if it falls and nobody, <laughs> nobody's there to hear it? I'm like, but do you have a really cool book if you, nobody's read it? Like, so, anyway, I was playing with that because we were talking last week to this week about the reader of the book, so... Um, do I need to go over what we're doing from this week to next week? We're doing a competition. We're taking screenshots of book covers that we like. And what was the first thing that we're doing? Do, do we send those to you, Jackie, or do we just hang on to them until next week? You can. Um, that's a great question, Pat. Um, everybody's welcome to email me during the week um, because I want to be supportive of the process, and we can like we can troubleshoot it. And then if we have, we could take the like. like we did uh, Robert's book cover. We'll take it to the group and get group feedback. And then everybody just, we're going to stay committed to doing the 10 to 15 minutes of the timer of the writing, whatever part of the writing is you're in the book, whether you're just writing like the intro or um, the competition, we're just going to stay committed to the whole writing process. So yes, we'd love to hear from you during the week. And, you know, sometimes I get feedback also during the week from Stephanie or Laura um, and even Rachel sometimes. On, on the projects. I, I just get tired of watching publication announcements coming out about books that are like uh, the one I want to uh, do, so that's what motivates me. Does it, and then I get, like, I, I, especially when you know you're on the zeitgeist of something, yep. when you know you're on the zeitgeist and you can see people moving into your uh, territory, I, I feel that's uh, really pain, like, uh, painful. Um, do you know, just, I'm just going to throw this out because what I, sometimes what I see, just because we get media leads, so media leads give me, give me a lot of landscaping. Um, I was watching just one of the areas I think that's going to open up in terms of zeitgeist, and this is kind of like off-center to what you're doing, Pat, but I just want to bring it up because it might be relevant, but it is off-center. It is this whole middle management, affecting middle management. Because so much of the focus is on like becoming the top leader, the top dog, CEO, leadership, but nobody ever focuses on the from a business perspective on the middle management and what that's yeah. like. Yeah. yeah, so I've been seeing that start to pop up in some of the business media leads that we're having. So I, I don't know. I'm just bringing that up because I think there's going to be something there for that as well. And if it's not for your book at all, it might be for your um, guestbook content. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. 
And uh, Stacy Richard, anything else? No, not at this point. Very good. All right. Okay. Well, I think then I think we're wrapped up for the week then. And um, right. Yeah. Stay in touch. Keep stay on. Uh, we're gonna send. We'll send the recording out because you'll get the PowerPoint slide. Pat, you've got last uh, two from last week to watch as well, which will catch you up. And that will be really good for you because it talks more about like how bookstore placements and how to, you know, how that whole strategy works in context to it. And Stacy, I love um, where you're going with your parenting coaching book. Parenting books um, do really, you know, do our, our one of our best sellers. So I'm um, here as a publishing company. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.